The Tom Woods Show, episode 2264. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. We all know it is time for us to break up, but everybody's status quo bias is standing in the way of this obvious and humane solution. Check out my brand new ebook called National Divorce, The Peaceful Solution to Irreconcilable Differences, which you can get for free at nationaldivorce.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're joined today by the person who joined us all the way back on episode number one of The Tom Woods Show, and that is Michael Bolden, founder and executive director of the 10th Amendment Center, an all-around great guy. Michael, welcome back for I don't know how many times it's been, but I'm thrilled to talk to you once again. Tom, awesome to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk about stuff. Yeah, let's talk about stuff. In particular, because I'm on your mailing list, because I, you know, hint, hint, I get on the mailing lists of organizations I support. Anyway, I'm on your mailing list, and I got the email about the annual State of the Nullification Movement report that you guys release. If this isn't the biggest one you've released, then I guess maybe I'm just not paying attention. Easily, easily. It's like 230 pages, free download at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. It's in two major sections. The first half answers a really important question. How do we enforce the limits of the Constitution? How do we advance liberty when we're Government refuses to do so 24-7, 365. And the second half of that, well, more than half, the second section really covers the status report of how we're seeing this being implemented, the strategies from the founders and the old revolutionaries implemented today on all kinds of issues. I'd at least like to cover things like the right to keep and bear arms, maybe even touch on things like uh, vaccine passports, stuff like that, depending on how much time we have. Yeah, because there's so much here. I'm going to, just for the sake of time, I'm actually going to skip over, even though it's very important, the first section of this report. And of course, I'll have the link to the report also at tomwoods.com slash 2264, because it is free. You can take a look at it. It gives you an idea of the work the 10th Amendment Center does. And you will, I think, then understand why I have been a donor to the 10th Amendment Center for, I don't a know, long time quite some and- time. <laughs> incredibly generous, my friend. I'm so grateful for it. Well, when people are doing things I support, I want to I wanna be part of it one way or another. So especially because I did a few episodes probably within yep. the past three, four months where I reviewed some of the basics on the question of nullification because it had been so long since I had done so. So instead, let's dig into some practical issues, like actual things you guys yeah. have been working on, particular areas you've been working in. So I'm actually going to fast forward a little bit to something that, To my knowledge, and I have to admit, this particular chapter I did not get to. It's right at the end. And it has to do with the Defend the Guard legislation. Oh, man. Now, my understanding of this is I don't think it has actually passed anywhere. No, but it's so important to take on the empire. Right. And it was, I believe it came out of the brain of Pat McGeehan, a state legislator in West Virginia. At least he's the first person I heard about it from. That is incorrect. It came out of the brain of your good friend, Michael Bolden. Oh, did it really? (laughs) Well, actually, one of the many, including things like the turn off the water to the NSA is another one. But let's TLDR that first section of the book so people have a frame of reference without having to jump to some other episodes right away. The short version is, please, constitutions don't enforce themselves, and words on paper never stopped people with power from exercising power or expanding it. So it's up to the people and the states to take action to resist, refuse to comply, and nullify federal acts as soon as they happen. James Madison told us that we're supposed to use a refusal to cooperate with officers of the Union. Defend the Guard is a great example of refusing to cooperate with officers of the Union. This is a piece of legislation that I kind of discovered back around 2008 or 9. It was really being pushed by a bunch of Green Party activists, a different version of it, basically saying, you know, if they don't follow UN resolutions, then they shouldn't use the National Guard in foreign conflicts. And I'm like, well, at least they're interested in pulling out some troops from these imperial conquests, these foreign wars and things like that. Cindy Sheehan had gotten on board with legislation that was filed in Oregon and 
Wisconsin and a number of states. And I thought, there's really something here. So we modified it more from a constitutional perspective. It was first introduced, I believe, in Maine around 2010 or so, and a handful of states were pushing it. But it really was Pat McGeehan who took the legislation. He improved on what we had drafted, improved it, some of the technical aspects, and really became the champion for it back in 2015. And now we see it really quickly becoming one of the most popular state-level pieces of legislation in the broader liberty movement, if we can call it that. And it would ban the state from releasing their guard troops into active duty combat unless, well, simple, the Constitution is followed. They use a declaration of war as required by the Constitution, which they haven't done since World War II. So basically, and according to the Guard itself, it makes up around 40 to 45 percent of the Army's divisional power. So this could have a great impact on their ability to continue waging these wars. I know Scott Horton has been active in this and pushing it, and I know it, it actually it came up when I was actually in the hospital last year and I had Scott fill in on the show. And that was one of the topics they talked about in my absence. So as I I did mention Pat McGeehan in West Virginia because I know he has tried to push this there. And I think, what is it, Wisconsin? Like, where has it actually been introduced? Well, in the previous sessions, it's been introduced in dozens of states. But now we're starting fresh January 2023, and it's so far been introduced in a handful of states. In Missouri, I think it's House Bill 166. Texas, I can't think of a bill number. Oklahoma is Senate Bill 29. In New Hampshire, it's House Bill 229. And we actually expect to see it filed in at least 15 other states in the next few weeks. The best organization to actually follow, even though (laughs) I'd like everyone to go to 10thamendmentcenter.com, the best organization that is doing the -the on-the-ground activism work on this is defendtheguard.us. And that's where you're going to be able to keep up with what exactly is going on. And if you want to support the efforts in those states, they certainly need some grassroots activism over there as well. All right. So that's an important one. I'm on board with every single thing in this whole report, but that's one that I think some people might not have heard of before. Whereas an issue like asset forfeiture, I think more people are aware of that. And that I just cannot for a second understand how anybody could support that or not understand the dangers involved in asset forfeiture or all the outrages, too, that are associated with it, where people, their property, what? They're charging property with a crime. Asset forfeiture is basically the idea of government saying, we're going to take your property for some reason. There's two types. There's civil and criminal. Criminal... I guess we could have less disagreement on. Basically, if you've been convicted of a crime and they can prove that you gained something out of that crime, you're going to forfeit that. Now, of course, that doesn't address the underlying issue that most crimes that are on the books really shouldn't exist in the first place. But that's a different question. The big one that we focus on is civil asset forfeiture, where you don't even have to be charged with a crime. And oftentimes they actually charge the property with the crime. I mean, you have to prove that the property wasn't involved in it somehow. Yeah, and so it's flips. impossible, in effect. They're asking you to Absolutely. do something that's impossible. That's it gonna flips due process cost on its you head a fortune. Completely. It's going to yes. cost you a fortune to pursue it. And sometimes it's because of something somebody else did. Yes. It cannot sometimes be that, a visitor on your property, whatever it is. A and guy all of a sudden, whose 18-year-old kid was selling a small amount of drugs out of his house at one point had his house taken from him. So... This is pretty nuts. The idea that property has no respect. Of course, we know that property rights are not respected by the establishment, by the supporters of the monster state. But this is one of the ways they really do it. And in fact, all those people who claim to say that they want government to help the poor, well, civil asset forfeiture, they're not going after the big ones. Of course, that's the excuse. We're going against the cartels and the big drug dealers and all the people with all the money. But really, the average forfeiture is often sometimes under a thousand bucks. And the people who are there taking the small amounts of money from, they don't have the money to be able to fight back against that. And so they're easy targets, just like what the IRS has been doing over the last year. So they target the people who have the least capability of defending themselves. So in what way is this a 10th Amendment matter? Obviously, if you're dealing with federal law enforcement, 
then I can see how it would be a 10th Amendment issue. I would guess most of this is happening, though, at the state level with state police. Well, there's two layers of civil asset forfeiture. One is on a state level. And of course, we want to see more liberty advanced everywhere. And the reason the 10th Amendment exists is not necessarily to empower state governments. It's certainly to create an environment where you have a chance for more individual liberty on a state-by-state basis. So if a state, let's say like California did a number of years ago, enacts a pretty strong restriction on civil asset forfeiture, they're still going to do it unless they address the so-called federal equitable sharing asset forfeiture program. Because what the feds do and what the states do, even if they're banned on a state level from using civil asset forfeiture. They just start claiming that everything's a federal issue. Oh, there's a drug here. Well, we've pulled you over in your car. There's drugs in the car. We think that the money that you have with you is proceeds of drug sales. So we're going to take your car. We're going to take your cash. And then we're going to say this is a federal law issue. We're going to go through the process of what's called adoption. We're going to call our buddies at the DEA. They're going to take control of the seizure. The locals will still do the work. And then the feds divvy out up to 80% of the take. And so you have to opt out of the federal equitable sharing program. I don't know the states off the top of my head, but I believe there's about eight states right now who have opted out of the federal program in a majority of cases. So that's an area where you feel like we have good prospects. I mean, it seems like that's exactly the kind of issue where the Tenth Amendment Center's message works for all kinds of people, for people on both sides of the ideological spectrum, and then just ordinary people who don't think about things but have a basic sense of fairness. You can see the most interesting coalitions come together on this group. I bet. Freedom Works on one end, ACLU on the other end, all saying, and it doesn't happen very often where organizations like this will set aside differences on other areas and say, you know, we got to stop this. The lead organization, I know I mentioned DefendTheGuard.us on this, the lead organization working against civil asset forfeiture is Institute for Justice at IJ.org. They put out a report grading each of the states on this every single year or so. And so if you want to keep track of how your state is doing, Of course, you can go get our annual State of the Nullification Movement report. But if you really want to drill down and get the nitty gritty on civil asset forfeiture, it's Institute for Justice. What are some of the other things that we might associate with the police that you feel like the 10th Amendment strategy would be appropriate for that you talk about here in the report? Oh, man, there's tons of them. But I think one of them is militarization of local police. If you oppose the war on drugs, you oppose federal gun control, you oppose restrictions on the right to keep and bear arms locally, you certainly don't want your police force to become a tool of the national state. And they do this in many ways. They hand out grants, just cash to participate in various federal state joint task forces. They hand out equipment. Of course, we've all heard about the 1033 program. You can get a Bearcat in Keene, New Hampshire or something like that, where they're going in with these. And I actually, years ago, when I first was getting involved in activism, I experienced at an anti-war protest back when the left was still involved in these types of things. Back in the day, there was a protest. And of course, all of a sudden, Bearcats, tracked armored vehicles start showing up from the LAPD. And this is a very menacing tool. It turns local police through money, tools, equipment. And of course, they also share surveillance equipment, cell site simulators, tracking devices, drone surveillance, and the like facial recognition tools through grants and gifts of tools to local police. And all that they have to do is basically opt out and not participate. The less that they're participating in these federal programs, the more they can actually do what they're supposed to do, which is be local peace officers rather than law enforcement officers for the federal government. Well, why don't we segue into a discussion of guns and the Second Amendment here? We can't miss that one. Yeah, especially, especially, well, I was going to say, especially because I know that there have been states where bills have been introduced that to the untrained eye might sound like they're pretty hardcore, yeah. But you and Meharry just aren't having it half the no, time. No, no. And first of all, let's start out on the positive part. There are three states, Missouri, Montana, and Arizona, that have passed 
excellent Second Amendment preservation legislation. I know you had Dave Rowland from the Freedom Center of Missouri on maybe sometime last year. He was influential in drafting and improving the Second Amendment Preservation Act in Missouri, which bans the state from participating in enforcement of a wide range of federal gun control measures, past, present, and future. And the ATF and the Biden administration is so upset about this, they're suing the state of Missouri right now. I'm not sure of the status of that lawsuit because I don't really, I'm not looking to courts to save us at all. But the state is actually, they've already opted out of enforcing a bunch of ATF laws. They're removing local and state law enforcement from ATF task forces. And so they don't like this. And they're not going to issue a lawsuit if they love it. So Just last week, at the end of December, the ATF sent out an open letter about this new frame or receiver rule. The Biden administration wants to treat firearms part kits, what they call 80 percent lowers, firearm parts as fully assembled firearms. And now if you're buying these part kits, you have to actually do a background check, get a serial number, all this stuff. Well, if no one participates in that, if there's 10 or 11 million undocumented 80% lowers, what they like to scare us with the name of ghost guns out there, and they're not following the federal rules or regulations on it, there's not much the feds can do about it, especially if states like Missouri, Montana, and Arizona don't help them enforce it. Because the way an average enforcement, the standard practice for a federal raid is to coordinate in advance with the local police or local sheriff's department to do all kinds of stuff, whether it's like traffic control blocking off a road so they can actually conduct the raid. Sometimes it's operating a helicopter, doing surveillance. And if they arrest somebody in Montana, for example, for violating this unconstitutional regulation, where are they going to hold them? Montana isn't going to allow them to use local jails for this. And I'm not sure if the ATF has any prisons in Montana. So what are they going to do? What are they going to rent out a Motel 6, a whole floor of it, and staff it 24-7 with security while they wait for extradition for up to three weeks to Idaho, who might turn it down as well? Like, this is going to create a logistical nightmare. But ultimately, if all the people comply with federal gun control measures... None of this stuff matters because it really gets down to a people being willing to exercise their rights, whether the government wants them to or not. I know we are skeptical of the courts as an instrument that is going to work for us in the long run. And there are a good many reasons for us to have that kind of skepticism. But isn't there a concern that if push ever came to shove and the federal government really began to threaten, let's say, a state like Missouri over legislation like this, that it might come down to, well, after all, in order to protect ourselves against whatever federal reprisals may come our way, we may need a favorable result from a judge somewhere. Well, I think a favorable result from a judge is always going to be good. We shouldn't put that down. It's just that what most people tend to do is they wait for the federal government to fix problems created by the federal government. That is not a population living in the land of the free. That is a people on its knees begging for permission. So, of course, we want the federal court system. We want the courts to do the right thing. We should push things in that direction when it's possible. But ultimately, as Thomas Paine once put it, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. Or Thomas Jefferson, you can't go wrong with Jeffersonian principles, He said, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as a gift of their chief magistrate. It really is up to the people to refuse to cooperate with officers of the union, just like James Madison told us to do in Federalist 46, if we want to see the government get stopped. Well, I want to talk about surveillance because I was just on vacation with your man, Mike Meharry, your communications director. I don't know how you get back on track right to work after a vacation. I'm usually in vacation mode for one to two weeks wanting to sip little tiki drinks. I know. but good man, good man. uh, Thank you. I travel all the time, so I'm I'm, I'm used to it at this point. But I know that Mike has been involved in this particular cause on the local level for quite some time. Yes. So let's talk about what are we talking about when it comes to surveillance? Obviously, there are surveillance activities that are going on, again, on the local and state level, whether it's red light cameras or whatever it is. But obviously, we have federal 
surveillance that, you know, some of which was denied, no doubt, for a long time. And then we found out it was going on. But what forms does this surveillance take? And what, if anything, can be done about it? Well, the surveillance is all the time, anywhere, everywhere, at every turn possible, whether it's the federal government or state and local governments. They are doing it constantly. And a lot of people like to focus just on the NSA or the FBI or the DHS or federal agencies. And that's a huge issue as well. And of course, I mentioned right at the beginning, our model legislation, the Fourth Amendment Protection Act to turn off resources to the NSA. We've seen one and a half states pass that. I say half California because they watered it down. My puns are intended. They watered it down from what I had drafted, which It was actually signed by Jerry Brown a few years ago, and it would have originally banned the state from basically providing electricity services to all FBI and DEA offices around the state. So they watered it down, and it really isn't having an impact in California, but it was passed in Michigan, and we're working to see that passed in other states moving forward. But the local-level surveillance is important and part of a Tenth Amendment strategy as well, because every piece of data that they're collecting locally through a post-Patriot Act thing called ISE, information sharing environment and fusion centers. There are about 70 of them around the country. If a local law enforcement agent in Boise, Idaho is using a license plate tracking device, ALPR, automated license plate reader, they upload that information through ISC or the fusion center and all law enforcement agencies on a state or a federal level have access to that information. So it is getting shared all over the place. So no data means no national surveillance. State. So if we restrict the locals from collecting or sharing that data in the first place, then it doesn't become part of that national surveillance state. And we can take these types of actions, whether it's on drone surveillance, on license plate tracking, even red light cameras. We don't really cover that as well, but that should be part of our work as well. Cell site simulators, something called Stingray devices. These are tools that spoof cell phone towers. And every phone in an area that would connect to a cell phone tower, all of its data first gets passed through the simulator or Stingray device where they collect your location information, text, conversations, and the like, and seamlessly goes through the cell tower. And then they pass that information along to the feds. And it's just this crazy web. We had seen some research from, I think, Muckrock and Electronic Frontier Foundation a few years ago that just on license plate reader scans, these ALPRs, over a two-year period, there were 25 billion scans had been done. And that was only on the ones that they were able to collect the data on through FOIA requests. So they're collecting a huge amount of data and restricting it is going to be very important going ahead. I'm going to jump to yet another topic. I'm doing a lot of jumping, but there's so much in this report and I want people to see the diversity of topics that are covered. Now, this one's easy because this one's been going on a while. Of course, I'm talking about the recreational and medicinal marijuana issue. Yeah. Now, that's just growing, and it seems like it has a momentum. Was that a pun? Uh, no, no, not intentionally, no. <laughs> it was, but it was unintentional. <laughs> but it seems like it has a momentum that is carrying with it almost an air of inevitability in yes. terms of where the rest of the states will eventually go with it. So in this case, you can say that this is a case of states doing something that on the books they are not allowed to do. There's no provision in the drug laws on the federal level to say, well, look, if you're a state and you really think this is a lot of BS, you can just ignore all this. <laughs> There's nothing, no provision that says that. And yet right. it happened anyway. On the other hand, I can see why it might be in the interest of the state governments to do this. Number one, there's a lot of popular pressure. That's good. That's a good yes. thing. But also, you know, they are going to make some tax revenue on it. So I can see that they would have a reason to want to do this. I wonder if cynically, if we really are being ruled by sinister people, I wonder if we they are. think. I wonder if they think. Well, you know, if we're ruling over all these people, it would be best for a lot of them to be in a drug-induced stupor, in a haze most of the time. Then think of what we'll get away with. You know, they'll be happy just to sit around giggling with their friends, and meanwhile, we'll rip them off. 
I mean, now or, that's very cynical, Michael. Very I'm cynical. Pretty, I'm pretty cynical myself, but ultimately it gets down to freedom of choice. And if people choose to be in a stupor, whether they're using a substance or whether they're not using a substance, whether they're absorbing CNN and in a different kind of stupor. Yeah, good things, answer. Things to put us in a stupor have been out there for a long time. Good answer, my friend. Time. Very good. <laughs> So ultimately, though, what this is doing is it's chipping away at the power of the central state. And I oppose the tax and regulate scheme on a state by state level. But ultimately, the more that we chip away at the power of the empire, the less power that empire has. And that is a win. And with 37 states opting out to at least some degree of federal prohibition on cannabis, eventually, and I made a video maybe seven, eight years ago. Now, I basically said, eventually, the feds are going to have to say that they're legalizing just to save face. And then basically, when that happens, because it is inevitable, this is going to happen. Eventually, when it happens, basically what the feds are going to be saying is, you know, all that stuff that all of you states, you've not been authorized to do, but you've been doing anyway. Well, now you can do it. And that shows that when enough people say no to the federal government, and enough states pass laws backing those people up, there's not a lot the feds can do to shove their so-called laws, regulations, or mandates down our throats. Now, there is a section in here on food freedom, and there's discussion of raw milk in there and stuff like that. But it's a little surprising, although, you know what, now that I think about it, it's not surprising, is it, that there isn't a section on COVID stuff. Because there isn't much yet, and there should be. I'd like to see more. We know that, for example, last year, New Hampshire passed, I believe it was House Bill 1455, to ban the state, all its political subdivisions, from assisting federal government in the enforcement of any COVID-19 vaccine mandates. And so that would be positive. There's legislation this year in Texas. I'm trying to think of the bill number. I think it's Senate Bill 307 from Bob Hill, maybe his name. But basically, that legislation that's under consideration now would be even broader. It would ban state and local enforcement of any federal statute, order, rule, or regulation issued for a public health emergency, because this stuff isn't going to be over. I think what we just went through, and I'm sure you do as well, it's kind of a trial run. They didn't get to do all the stuff that they wanted to do. They did not have a centralized vaccine passport, which I'm sure they would love to put on a national ID card to make it a lot easier for them to restrict the movement of the people. So it's important to see states do this. And generally, we add sections to our annual report like we did with Defend the Guard, even though none have passed that because we start seeing some momentum on that. And maybe if Texas follows up on this or if Missouri passes this year's Senate Bill 358 to ban the enforcement of any federal regulation, any of them, automatically until it's specifically approved for enforcement in the state by the state legislature, including ones that are on the books as well. So if we see things like this start happening, I think that will build some momentum to protect us against the next public health emergency, as of course they'll call it when it comes down the line. When I was thinking through this question, it occurred to me, well, most of what actually was implemented, with the exception, certainly big exception of the vaccine passports. Well, no, the vaccine passports, we also saw that on a local level too. Yes. But in terms of the mandates for employment, that was a federal thing. Most of the worst of it really was carried out on the state level. And so With that was a lot a of federal funding for it, right? Because of course, without the federal money coming in, how could they have gotten away with that? That's true. That's true. So I think this is a case where in a way we want to protect against things that maybe didn't come to full fruition. Right. Or didn't happen at all, but that we know they're ambitious enough to want and maybe yes. maybe seek next time. And even though this isn't really kind of in my, what's the, when you get a softball thrown at me, this isn't in my wheelhouse. As I scroll through and I look through thousands of pieces of legislation every week, most of it is absolutely disgusting. I am actually seeing a lot, I think, and I don't track these specifically, a lot that would restrict the ability on a state level to issue those types of mandates going forward. South Carolina, Texas, Missouri, and a number of other states have already seen legislation that I haven't looked at closely 
to address this locally. And it's similar then to the civil asset forfeiture issue, because, of course, if you want to advance liberty on civil asset forfeiture, you can't just ignore what's going on on a state level. But then you have to understand that there's a tie in to what happens on a federal level as well. So if we really want to deal with these so-called public health emergencies, you do have to address things on both the state and the federal level to really get a win. Right, right. Well, let me just say that since it has been disclosed that I've been a donor of yours for a while, I've been very, very pleased with what's been done with my support. I guess I do want to ask you a little bit of a meta question, if I may, just out of my own personal curiosity. Apart from organic social media traffic and word of mouth, what do you actually do, I hate this word, proactively, Oh, to, man. To get the word out about the existence of the 10th Amendment Center. Like, how do you get new eyeballs on your stuff? Well, we really focus, if you want to focus on a social media marketing strategy, we really focus on a content strategy. We have over 10,000 articles, blogs, podcasts, videos on our website. We have so much content out there for over 15 years. We do get a lot of organic, but we aggressively push it through social not just on the mainstream platforms, but on all the so-called alt platforms. We want to reach people where they are. We don't get mainstream coverage from almost anybody, so we definitely rely on that. And it certainly does the job. We do some advertising campaigns as well to push that even further. So it's a relentless 24-7, 365 content pushing strategy to get this info out to more people. I was just thinking the same thing about myself, that it's hard. You, know, you have the name 10th Amendment Center. Well, you know, somebody's ears will prick up when they hear, oh, I kind of like the 10th Amendment. Whereas the Tom Wood Show, who the heck is this? <laughs> you know, So it's a little trickier <laughs> for me to get the word out. And especially when there are so many other institutions and content creators vying for the same audience. But you guys have been around, what, since 2006? 2006. What I find interesting, though, and I, you know, and I've been seeing some things that Elon Musk is posting over on Twitter now that it's more of an interesting platform once again. And he talks about how the ratio of likes to people viewing content. And I think he said it was somewhere around 100 to 1. Ours are nowhere near that. I think people are hungry for solutions. So even though we're the little Tenth Amendment center that could, the amount of people who engage with and interact with what we put out there is much higher than what I see from a lot of other organizations. You can see groups with a million followers get like 10 likes on something, but we definitely are not living in that situation because we're giving people tools to advance liberty, whether the government wants them to or not. You must, though, from time to time, I guess this is probably where I'll I'll leave it, but you must run into the problem of (laughs) people who are, you know, they're kind of in conventional political boxes. And there's nothing conventional about the 10th Amendment Center. I mean, it's very good that some people who have otherwise conventional views are willing to entertain the idea of nullification, which is quite unconventional. That's good. But the fact that you really believe in the 10th Amendment across the board, and you will say things about the U.S. war machine in connection with the something like the Defend the Guard Act, this could throw some people off guard. Do you just say, well, sorry, or I don't know, do you try to educate them? I think it throws most people off guard. Most people think that if you support the right to keep and bear arms, you're going to be a Republican across the political spectrum. If you're opposed to, well, this kind of flips over the years, right? (laughs) Right, I mean, the the anti-war people aren't on the left really anymore. They've been gone for years. It's really sad, but it really makes me double down motivated. And sometimes... Sometimes. I know we had, Mike Meharry and I had a meeting at ACLU headquarters in New York a few years ago, and we're there and we're talking about stuff and we're really focusing on state level pro-privacy legislation. But they throw out this little joke like, oh yeah, and you guys are into that whole that gun and anti-Obamacare stuff. Ha, 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 ha. And they want to laugh at us and put us down a little bit. We're like, yeah, okay, whatever. Let's focus on the work here at hand. So we do run into that all the time. A lot of times people are not interested in hearing what you have to say unless you agree with them on everything already. But we have to push forward with what we believe is right. And for us at the TAC, it really is focusing on the Constitution, every issue, every time, no exceptions, no excuses. We have to work to advance liberty. 
all across the political spectrum. Well, I think everybody knows what happens at this point of the episode. I make a, a teary appeal to my listeners about how meaningful the work of the 10th Amendment Center has been for me because I've watched it and I've been a big supporter. I've spoken at your events when you were silly enough to make yourself crazy by trying to put on events Ooh. all over the country. I spoke at those. You know, and you were one of the people I called, just a handful of people. I mean, maybe you were the only person I called as I was finishing up my book on nullification in 2010. And I just had a few questions like, well, how do I answer this objection or that Man, objection? And I talked to you. That you was know, awesome too. That was so awesome. I'm like, heck yeah. I was such a fanboy at that point, Tom. And you're like, hey, I, you know, I see you guys working on this. And I decided to shift gears and work on this book. But we have hit it off as such great friends for so many years. And I'm so grateful for that. Our friendship but also the support. You've really helped nurture the TAC into a much wider audience. And I'll be eternally grateful for that. Well, it has been my pleasure. And I will say that there are a lot of very large organizations out there that claim to be fighting the same battle. But when push comes to shove, they will smear or ignore the 10th Amendment Center because your strategy is not respectable. See, our strategy is to write a lot of newspaper columns you know, and, and try to convince the elites that they should behave differently. Okay, you're absolutely free to pursue that strategy. I Nothing I can do to stop you. But the rest of us are a little bit more impatient than that and would like to try things that are not approved in the New York Times. And that's what the 10th Amendment Center has been doing. It's been educating people. It's been edgy. It's been taking stances like your proposal to turn off the water to the NSA facilities in Utah because the state could simply turn the water off and just not cooperate with them. And they need an enormous amount of water to cool their systems. I mean, this is the sort of thing that pops into the brain of Michael Bolden. And you've got on CBS News. It's a big deal. Whereas meanwhile, how are the rest of these people going to handle this problem? Well, some of them are making excuses at the time for why we need to surveil some people because they're bad and this, this that and the other thing. And others of them were just, well, maybe someday some judge will help us. And you were actually coming up with real, actionable ideas. And so, yeah, if you donate to the 10th Amendment Center, it's not the same thing as donating to the blah, blah, blah foundation. I won't mention any names or the such and such institute. I won't mention any names. It's quite different because your money's not going to go to Michael Bolden's chauffeur. Michael Bolden doesn't even drive. Well, which that's why you need a chauffeur. <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> it's going to go right to Uber. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But it's going to go to the work and programs of the 10th Amendment Center. So if you're thinking, well, you know, I do want to support the cause, but what's a good place to put my money where I know it won't just be wasted by idiots? Well, the 10th Amendment Center. So I love the 10th Amendment Center. You should donate. You can go to 10thamendmentcenter.com and do that. You might be able to go directly, if I'm remembering this right, Michael, to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash donate. Is that, you if got that's it. Not, if that's not the page, it ought to be. Like you, my friend, I love a clean and easy URL to remember. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash donate. And of course, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report is really where I think if you're listening to this and you're not sure like, okay, what is this all about? You got to read that free book. It's massive and it's got tons of info. And I urge you to share it as widely as possible. Yeah, you will absolutely love it. So go check that out, everybody. It's all linked to tomwoods.com slash 2264. Michael Bolden. Time to get back to work fighting for all of us, and we appreciate you. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.